Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us in this middle of the week webinar with two of my favorite people and two perhaps of South Africa's favorite people. I'm sitting here with Mandy Wiener and Anton Harbour today, and they're going to share their wisdom that they wrote about in their books, um, Mandy Wiener's The Whistleblowers and Anton Harbour's So For The Record. So we're going to discuss it um, properly and in depth, and we're going to take all of your questions. So make sure that you keep them coming because this is the story of South Africa. This is the story of how we got here. Um, and this is the story of the struggle still to continue. So uh, we are very excited to have the two experts um, discussing their, their work here. So welcome Mandy and Anton, they are both um, authors, journalists. Anton is a professor at WITS. Mandy is a radio journalist and host at 702, Radio 702. Um, so they come also with years and years of experience, decades even. Um, and I want to dive right in um, with what we will be discussing today. Firstly, however, I want to thank our Maverick Insiders. Without you guys, this and all the other webinars will not be possible. We appreciate you um, and, and we thank you for supporting Daily Maverick and the people that we work with. Now, the structure of today will focus on three main points. The one would be obviously journalism for the bad of the country, where journal there's a lot spoken and a lot um, discussed about journalism and how good it can be. Um, but the dark side and the underbelly of when it goes wrong is, is not often discussed because we don't really want to. And it's, it's something that, that's a hard, a hard theme to discuss for journalists. Um, so we will look at the state capture project in South Africa and how it was egged on and assisted by, by certain journalists. But then also the, the fantastic other side of that picture where the most journalists in South Africa is there for the good of it. We think of the people of the country. We think of how we can ensure that we shine light on the facts and how we find a balance between telling the secrets and shining a light on things that it has previously not been known, but also about how we can protect our sources and to ensure that we keep the people that share their secrets with us safe. And keeping all of this together are the whistleblowers of South Africa. It's a subject that everyone knows about. Everyone reads about often because when you read a journalistic report or investigation, you will read such and such a source has said this or they've given you that. But very few people actually discuss what it takes to give a journalist information that can either land you in jail, cost you your life and ensure that you lose your pension, your job and your family. So keeping all of this together is the journalists and the whistleblowers of South Africa and the trials and tribulations that they go through. Thank you so much for meeting us here at around two o'clock in the afternoon. Now, before we dive right in, I want to tell you about a fantastic offer. We will both afford you, for those who just logged in, Mandy Wiener's The Whistleblowers and Anton Harper's So For The Record um, in the offers button at the right side of your screen um, on prices, sale prices. It's a little early Black Friday kind of sale. So diving right in, I want to I want to read first this preface in Mandy Wiener's book that she starts with. And it comes from a person that I have great regard to. Her name is Musila Motepo. She was the former Trillion Financial Advisory CEO. And maybe Mandy will dig right into Trillion a bit later. But Trillion was affiliated with Guptas and McKinsey um, and, and the State Capture Project and especially Eskom and some of the state-owned companies. Now, when Mosila Motepo realized that something is massively wrong, she blew the whistle at great cost to herself. And this is what she has to say about the term whistleblower and about being labeled as someone who blew the whistle. 
and I read, she says, I don't like the term whistleblower. It's impersonal. It's like a shadowy, faceless, voiceless person in an underworld who has no family and has no soul. It's almost a ghost. But I guess it's a whistleblower because most of us are anonymous. We don't get awards. We don't get money. We are heroes. We are warriors. And you don't need or you need to recognize that. Investigative journalists call us sources. No, I am a human being. I'm a sister. I'm a lover. I'm a career person. I have aspirations. I'm a human being. And where do you get your sources from? You get it from us. You guys go back to the office. You write a story. You are paid. I'm not paid. I have given up my livelihood, risked my family for South Africa, and I'm left with the aftermath of an unemployment, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety. You can name it. Criminal charges, everything. You guys go back to work on Monday. You get an award, you get paid, you get a pat on the back. Nobody recognizes or funds us for the aftermath and it's ugly. It's nonsense. We are heroes, we are not whistleblowers. That is the lived experience of someone who did really give up everything and who can, in all right, call herself a whistleblower. Now, Mandy, please help us. You wrote this book by telling us the tale of two handfuls of people who might or might not really fit into the whistleblower category and who may or may not want to wear that whistleblower badge. Tell us about these people and that little golden thread that takes all of it together and tells the story of the whistleblower of South Africa. Thanks so much, Polly, and thank you everyone uh, for, for joining us uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon. So look, this, this quote from Mosilo Motepu, who was the Trillian whistleblower, for me was so poignant and so powerful um, mm. because it really does speak to the experience of, of whistleblowers and this label uh, that they are given of being a whistleblower. And Mosilo didn't give me an interview uh, for the book, although Bianca Goodson spoke to me because Mosilo is writing her, her own book. And also just because as she says, that the trauma was still so real and, and so raw for her. But the way that she sets it out about how this this branding of whistleblower, it, it, there's so much more to it. Journalists get the awards, NGOs and civil society get the funding, and whistleblowers get forgotten about. And that is very much the experience of many of the whistleblowers that I spoke to for the book. And the reason that I wanted to, to do this and, and write this book, instead of writing about organized crime or, or gangsters or, or whatever it is, although that features throughout this book as well, is yeah. because we all know the stories of, of state capture. I mean, you and your colleagues have done an amazing job of following the money and putting all the pieces together. But for me, it's that human narrative. It's the, the people behind the stories that we just don't know enough about that we don't appreciate. And that's why this quote is, is so powerful because it really tells mm. you about that that human story and what the impact is on the individual. Mm. Uh, Anton, I see that you gave a nod to the whistleblowers at the very start of your book. You, you in fact, wrote this book sort of um, in as an ode to the whistleblowers. Is there, in your experience, a common thread or a common characteristic of a South African whistleblower? What kind of people are they? What do they do? Um, and, and what are their thought processes in, above all, providing us with information? Look, I, I think, and I think it's made clear by Mandy's book, which brings out the human element behind each of these, that they have many different motivations and many different motivations. Some are there to save their own skins, quite frankly. Mm. Some are there out of purely because they saw there was a need and the country needed it and they felt a moral obligation to speak up. Um, others did it, as I said, to save their skin or because they saw things that wanted to go wrong and uh, you always want to be the first whistleblower. I think that's the rule when, when the net is closing on you, you want to be first. So there are many different motivations, um, and I, I don't generalize, um, but I think we, we appreciate them all. Let me say this, 
And when you're a journalist, you need to know the motivation of the person in order to understand and accept their information. But the truth is, we have many great sources who do it for all the wrong reasons. Mm. Personal, personal protection, but it's information coming out that's of most importance. Mm. Such a poignant answer because every journalist will tell you that they evaluate their sources on their own merit and uh, a bad source or a bad person can be um, uh, the bearer of amazing news and amazing information. Anton, we have a few volume um, queries with you. Will you just try to um, unmute and, or mute and unmute yourself and come a bit closer to your laptop so that we can hear you clearly? And while you're doing that in the meantime, Mandy, I want to chat to you about um, some of the poignant stories that you highlight of these whistleblowers. Um, one which I particularly enjoyed was the very first one of Moss Parkway uh, that you wrote about, and he was in fact one that lost his life. Will you tell us about this Rustenburg warrior of ours? So for me, the story of, of Moss Parkway is, is, is really, really powerful and stayed with me for a long time mm -hmm. because this is the classic case of a loyal, dedicated cater of the ANC um, who was a meticulous civil servant. He was the kind of guy who would sit in the council in Rustenburg and go line by line through expenses and making sure that every cent was accounted for. And he started picking up corruption in the municipality in Rustenburg. And this was around 2008, 2009, when the campaign for Jacob Zuma to become president was in, in full swing. And he started to pick up this corruption. Many um, of, of his colleagues joined him and they started to raise the alarm about, in particular, the mayor at the time, Matthew Wormerantz. And they ended up going to Nkandla to see Zuma, they spoke to Gwede, Mantashe, and various other ANC leaders. And ultimately, it ended with this meeting with um, Sikkelo Shikkeka, who was the uh, Minister of Cooperative Governance at the time. And at this meeting in Rustenburg, Moss Parkway presented his dossier in front of Matthew Bormerans, the mayor. And at that meeting, he said to Bormerans, you can hate me, but don't hurt me. And two days later, Moss Parkway was shot dead in his driveway after hanging up ANC posters. And for a long time, nothing happened in this case. And then Matthew Wormerantz and his bodyguard were um, prosecuted and were convicted for the murder of Moss Parkway. A year later, it went on appeal to the High Court in, in Mahi King, and it was overturned. And Matthew Wormerantz became a member of parliament. So here's the story of a guy who exposed corruption. He went all the way to, to the top of, of the ANC. He landed up getting killed. And his, for his family, there's been no justice. His son, Tlolo Pakwe, says that um, he's been forgotten by the ANC, that there's been no justice. And he, car he carries a very, very heavy burden. He carries the legacy of, of his father. And unfortunately, this is the story of, of a whistleblower. It parallels with Jimmy Mokhlala in Mpumalanga, who was the speaker of the municipality there, who was also shot for exposing corruption. He also has, um, has several children who've had to carry this legacy. And Jimmy Mokhlala's son speaks about the legacy of truth that his father left him. So it, it really is quite heart-wrenching that there's been no justice in these cases. And yet these are, are loyal civil servants who exposed wrongdoing, who spoke out against their, their comrades, and this has been the result. Um, a poignant tale, and I enjoyed so much the fact that you described how he drove back to his home in a car plastered with the face of President Zuma at the time, for who he campaigned, um, and with the ANC flags. I think we picked up on why the sound quality is not great. So whenever anyone else is speaking, just mute yourselves on the other side. Okay, so that just ensures that there's no disturbance. So um, I want to ask you, Anton, as well about um, about the whistleblowers in the case of of what you are describing as um, as as the Gupta leak case um, which came to, to Daily Maverick in a certain way that I'll leave for you to tell that story um, and 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 helped us in, to ensure that we could shine a light on what happened but before we take this whistleblower early or further I want to go to a theme which none of us as journalists really enjoy 
and that would be to talk about the underbelly of journalism, about how easy it is for a whistleblower or for a source to manipulate and to give you information um, that's false or to try and um, it, sort of skew your perception of a certain subject or theme and for that maybe you should need to tell us how d journalists work and how easy it actually is and how difficult it is to for a journalist to ensure that they I lost you at the end, uh, um, Pauline, but let me pick up. Um, um, yes, yeah, so it, so, so um, part of my book deals with the story of Gupta Leaks, and there um, it's a great story because you had sources there, you had whistleblowers there um, who did it, I think, out of uh, a pure moral compulsion. I think they were the best kind of whistleblowers. They did it just because they felt it was the right thing to do. And Mandy also deals with them, so um, I think she'll agree with me on that. Um, what's great about the story is how they came across this information um, almost by accident, well, entirely by accident, but they had the wisdom to see its importance and value and went through many processes in order to get it out. Um, into the public eye. You know, for me, um, you talk about journalists writing about journalists, um, and one doesn't want to just be a navel-gazing journalist uh, uh, confronting internal issues. The issues I raise, particularly in my criticism of journalists, is there because I think as journalists we need to confront the issues, the problems, the limitations of what we do. Um, and I use the Sunday Times example to show, uh, and, I, and I hope what I do is I show both the potential for great journalism that does so much good, but also make journalists and, and other people more aware of the limitations of journalism, what journalism can't do, how it can go wrong. I think that in this age of uh, malicious disinformation, we absolutely all need to be hyper aware of both the, the, the importance and the value as well as the limitations of journalism and understand how it works because we have to apply our mind critically um, to assess information that's coming out there. Um, and But most importantly, us, we as journalists have to, I think, work hard to rebuild and shore up and strengthen our credibility and the trust the public has for us um, if we're going to keep on doing what we're doing. Uh -huh. I think in, in, in the last few years, which have broken down that trust. And I think we have to work very hard. And the first, you know, and the first way you do it is admit to what we got wrong and deal with what we got wrong, um, which was substantial. And then we can um, proceed from there. Can you briefly take us through what happened at Sunday Times? There were the three stories, um, uh, just a line on each. Um, but what led, and you were part of that investigation um, and, and uh, of what happened in the end, um, and part of the recommendations of how to strengthen that institution. Now, I want you to, at the back of what happened, tell us how can such a thing happen? What was what is wrong with journalism? Um, and I, I note that whenever America sneezes, uh, we catch the cold as well. And I note that's, that we have similar problems to what happens in the rest of the world. We're obviously not immune um, uh, to similar problems and, and the tides of the times. Yes, so I tackle the, the three stories for which the Sunday Times eventually had to apologize. Three stories they got horribly wrong allowing themselves to be misled and in doing so I think enabled uh, state capture and assisted the state capture project. It was of course the Cato Manor a death squad story. There was a there was a human rights story there but they allowed the story to be mis they allowed themselves to be misdirected um, to tackle people who were who were blockages to state capture. There was the illegal rendition story much the same. Um, I believe there was a story um, there that, that was legitimate. Um, but once again, sources misdirected them and they went after the wrong people in that story. 
uh, for, for, for all the wrong reasons. Um, and the third story, of course, and the most infamous is the SARS rogue unit story. And that's different because I'm not sure there was a story there. And that was almost entirely a fabrication. And one of the things I, I try and expose and look at is uh, the involvement of both both um, both the state, both um, the tobacco industry, and state security and crime intelligence in leading the Sunday path. So I ask, why does this happen at the Sunday Times? I mean, the people, the sources who were looking to manipulate the media tried other newspapers. The Sunday Times was the one that fell for it worst. And I, I explain it at three levels. I look at the individuals involved and what was their motivation. I look at their practice and their culture that allowed it to happen. And then I look at what's happening in the media and journalism widely. Um, and so, and so to, to sum that up very quickly, um, um, what I show is that there was a culture in the Sunday Times which allowed them to cut corners. Mm -hmm. um, I think because of a long arrogance, because of their power and their wealth, they could do what the hell they liked. But it caught up with them and they were cutting corners and there was a culture of, of deep-rooted arrogance in the newspaper that um, allowed them to do that and, and enabled them to be manipulated. But it also happens in the wider context of uh, the newspaper industry and the political pressures and how that came to bear on a paper like the Sunday Times. You're breaking up a bit, so I'm going to stop you there, just see if you can sort out your Wi-Fi problem. Um, but Mandy, I want to ask you what, what is very clear here from Anton and from our lived experience as journalists is certain institutions were targeted, SARS definitely, and uh, the renditions and um, uh, the Cato Manor squad was three generals. Um, being targeted. So the Hawks, uh, generals and the Hawks itself. Now the Hawks obviously were the priority crime fighters and the SARS uh, looked at uh, very important state officials and government officials but also their benefactors. Now it's very clear that there's always a target um, and a reason for that target. Now if you if you go back to the whistleblowers, is it perhaps a good idea to uh, to provide a monetary reward to these whistleblowers um, to ensure that they somehow come up with with better and better curated information, or would that be counterproductive in your uh, in your estimate? So let's look firstly at what happened with uh, the various law enforcement agencies, as you speak about, how they were eviscerated during the state capture era. They were hollowed out. We saw uh, so much competent capacity moving to the private sector as a result of that, which meant that our fight against law enforcement was um, was was really um, you know affected in a huge way. The result of that is that many of these whistleblowers. Uh, involved in the state capture, um, whistleblowing, didn't know who to go to. So if the board was captured, if the minister was captured, if the police are captured, um, who do you go to? Who do you blow the whistle to? And that's why many of these whistleblowers took such a long time to come out and they mulled this over for such a long period of time. So my argument is that you have to stack the cards in their favor because we need whistleblowers. The only way you are going to fight corruption is if you entice whistleblowers. Um, if they constantly speak truth to power and power continues to prevail, we are not going to see whistleblowers coming forward. So one of the options is something like they have in the US, which is the False Claims Act. And the False Claims Act allows for individual citizens to uh, pursue wrongdoing, and they are then entitled to between 15 and 25 or 30 percent of the money that is recovered. So that is one of the options we can look at. And people are very divided on that issue because there are pros and cons. The, the pros is that it then protects whistleblowers financially and it entices them to come forward. But then you also see 
all kinds of, of, of problems with bounty hunters, with dodgy lawyers, um, you know, going after, after this, there's vendettas. Um, and then it, it does get a bit murky, but it's definitely one of the options that we need to look at. And it was raised by Bianca Goodson, the other trillion whistleblower, when she wrote she wrote that letter to Andre Dereta last month. Because as a result of Bianca Goodson's whistleblowing, 1.6 billion rand was returned to the fiscus. And she is unemployed, she's unemployable, she is broke, she can't get a job, um, she's had to cash out her pension, and that. It just doesn't make sense for that to happen. You see, it's worrisome um, when you have you're, when you're a whistleblower and you see around you the same the fate this fate happening to other whistleblowers. They don't have jobs. They lose their pension. Um, they are completely broke. Uh, they're destitute. Um, they lose their houses. So, so there's no real incentive for a whistleblower to come forward um, unless they really have. Uh, you know the South African country as a whole in in their thoughts and and the means to to survive without an income, which is uh, none of us. So it's definitely something that we need to properly look at. Is Parliament maybe the place where we should push for it, or should it be a corporate uh, initiative, or should journalists start uh, lobbying for this? What is your your what does your research show? Because we can chat about it, and we can talk about it, but how do we get this from the ground? How do we start this? So I think it's one of our biggest concerns when I was writing this book is that people would read it and then they would be left completely bereft and that they wouldn't want to blow the whistle. And that is not what I'm trying to achieve here. I'm hoping that it starts a conversation and that I can advocate for exactly this, um, what we're talking about here, because there has to be a change. And that change uh, comes in, in, in various guises. So firstly, there has to be a societal revolution in how we treat whistleblowers, um, the stigma that needs to be addressed. Um, that instead of being pushed to the fringes of society, they are applauded, they are hired, they're placed on boards as ethics officers, they're giving, given national orders. But then we also need to look at the legislation. And, and that's a, a whole other conversation because the legislation we have in South Africa, the Protected Disclosures Act is fundamentally flawed. And it's, it, it's good in theory, but in practice it is not. And there are various options that could happen around that. And, and I would really like to see a motivation from journalists, from civil society, from the public to see better legislation legislation introduced in South Africa for whistleblowers to be better protected so that we can encourage whistleblowers to come forward. Corruption Watch says 2,000 whistleblowers came forward in the first half of this year about COVID um, PPE procurement. And, you know, we, we absolutely need these whistleblowers to come forward. And the only way we're going to do that is if we ensure that they, they are better protected. And there are proposals. I look at various options from around the world. And, and, and many of those could be looked at for South Africa as well. While Anton is trying to log in properly again, I want to ask you, um, you know, it's very confusing for people who doesn't work with journalists or, whist or whistleblowers necessarily to make sense of the information being pushed out in public. Let's say this sitting with a rendition story or a Cato Manor story or a SARS story, you know, or even a Gupta leak story um, that's writing that the president of a country has been captured and is being the face of a, a massive mafia movement. How do you, as a person who is a lawyer or a housewife or a uh, anyone in in um, a boardroom, a doctor, you know, how, how do they discern between proper news, um, news that is factual, news that's believable? Uh, journalists that that you can trust and believe. Um, do you have a few pointers for people um, to discern between what might be fake um, and harmful news? Um, so there's a lot of advice um, and in every interview that I did in the book I asked the whistleblowers for advice. Some of it's practical like keep a diary, make sure you have all the records, make sure you give somebody a copy of the evidence that they can blow it up if something happens to you. Um, some of it is is more um, theoretical. 
uh, or philosophical at least, you know, make sure you've got a good support base, make sure that your, your family backs you um, because it becomes emotionally a, a, an enormous burden to carry. Um, but if we look at the Gupta League story as an example, that is a great example of a situation where you have Stan who comes across this hard drive from within the very depths of the Gupta Empire, he is able to discern through his own analysis that this is credible, that it needs to be exposed. But then where does he go? What does he do with it? Um, he gets hold of somebody who's got links to the media. He tries to speak to a DA member of parliament who doesn't rock up at their meeting. He goes to the Mail and Guardian and does this whole stalking approach to make sure that he's not being followed, but they're closed. And then he just thinks, well, who must I give this to? And this is the dilemma for many whistleblowers. And he was very fortunate that he landed up with Branko and Steph at, uh, at, at um, Daily Maverick and at Amabungani because he was valued, he was protected, he was secured. And not every whistleblower has that experience. And, and that's the problem, is that many people don't know which route to pursue, which is why we need more protection, more structures in place. There are incredible organizations that do help whistleblowers. Um, Corruption Watch does a lot. Alta does a lot. Pluff um, has helped many of the state capture whistleblowers. The Ahmed Katrada Foundation um, assists with, with legislation. Uh, so so there, there are organizations that are are doing a lot of work, but we need to see more from society and, and from journalists in, in terms of protecting whistleblowers as well. Yeah, absolutely. Anton, I was asking Mandy if she has pointers, and I want to ask you too. Um, pointers to people at home listening to us about how to read in a discerning way, how to differentiate between fake news, um, well, not fake news, f f fake facts or f fake uh, uh, information being pushed out in the public, um, uh, as opposed to proper investigative pieces? Are there certain markers? Are there certain things that you can look out for? How do you, as a person who is not a news hound, how do you ensure that, you, uh, that you're not being misled perhaps by a rendition story or a Cato Mana story or a SAR story? Well, there's certainly um, a number of things one can do. I hope you hear me clearer now. There certainly are a number of things you can do as, and you, I think you, you're obliged to do and you really need to do as a consumer of news to make sure that you're differentiating between real news um, and disinformation. I don't like the phrase fake news. I prefer not to use it. Um, so, for example, um, um, always look where the information comes from. If it's from a journalist or an outlet you don't know, um, you can take the first step towards believing something if it's from a credible outlet. doesn't mean it's 100% true, but the first step is who wrote this, where does it come from, or can I see it carried or verified on a credible um, uh, website? If it's on a website you've never heard of before, if you, it's on a website that looks amateurish, um, if it's full of spelling and other little errors, um, the, if it's on a site that doesn't tell you who they are and where it comes from, these are some of the many red flags one looks for in discerning inf whether information is valid or not valid. But I think, you know, if you go to us, if you go to the site of an organization like Africa Check and the fact checking organization, then they give you a whole set of steps you should go to if you have reason to doubt. Um, any information, the, the veracity of any information out there. The most important thing, though, is to is to read and consume from brands and journalists and outlets that you know and you have built trust with over time. Yeah, absolutely, and and perhaps not trust just one um, information source. Maybe read widely. Uh, you know, you there will always be at least perception differences between journalists. So um, it's it's always a good idea to read more than one publication. Oh, now, I want to as much as you can and be as skeptical as you can of them all. Uh, don't believe anything at first. Yeah, absolutely. And ask questions. If journalists can't answer your questions, there's a problem. Now, I want us to move on from 
really the bad and the worst of, of journalism, but also to the good and the very best. Um, and that might be one of the, the most recent examples. Um, Mandy quickly gave a rundown of Stan and the hard drive. But Anton, I want you to properly explain how that hard drive came to Stan, to Branko Brikic, our editor at Daily Maverick. Um, and, and then I want to specifically discuss the difference in how journalists think about news and how corporates and, and people in corporates may think of how to influence um, the news around us. And I want you to, to give me your idea of should journalists um, aim to influence and aim to, to, uh, to ensure that they can change um, to certain people in the country, you know. So um, I, I, I'm specifically, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but please lead us into that discussion. Look, one of the things highlighted in my book um, are interests who, who uh, are people or organizations with interests that kind of supersede the journalism and, uh, and, and, and the truth seeking. In the case of Gupta Leaks, um, it's quite interesting because one of the major backers of the journalists who were exposing Gupta Leaks, uh, a very well-known businesswoman who um, said she would give financial support to protect and secure the whistleblowers and to enable the story to come out, um, she thought she knew better than the journalists when and how it should come out. You'll have um, to name. <laughs> it's in your book. You'll have to name the names. Well, people should buy my book. But, of course, it's the very known um, um, businesswoman, Marta Wierzajski. Very difficult to pronounce name. Uh, but she generously said she would assist financially in, 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 in getting the story out and protecting the whistleblowers. But she decided off her own bat that she knew better than the journalist how it should come out, when it should come out. And she, and, and, and she was in political circles that were looking to feed the information into a critical ANC, NEC meeting, hoping to use it to bring down Zuma. And it was a perfect example of how when you let the politics get in the way of the journalism, when you motivate it not by doing the best story in the best way uh, with the most impact, but you're worried about it uh, trying to get it to impact on the politics, um, that it leads to problems and disaster. In this case, it endangered the lives of the sources, the whistleblowers. Um, it potentially, uh, fortunately, in the end, the story still had major impact, but it had the potential to unwind the whole story. It was most unfortunate. It was an act of of extraordinary arrogance by somebody who thought because she was rich and powerful, she knew better than the journalists what they should be doing. And maybe one of deceit because uh, you very clearly show how she first denied uh, that she gave a hard drive to to um, various people, uh, about 200 people, um, and then later only said, yes, well, maybe. Um, and in between, she threatened you with a lawyer. So it's, <laughs> it's an interesting um, tale that you're telling. But I think what, what needs to be highlighted here is that journalists don't time stories. We don't look at events and decide that we want to influence a certain happening or a certain meeting or a we don't want a certain outcome. What is very clear, what I get from your book and from the work that Mandy do and from what I do, is we have stories that we finalize and investigate and, and try to how we think how we can present it, but we don't try to time it in, in, in terms of um, what is happening in the politics at that time. Uh, and when it's ready, it's ready, and then you publish it. Uh, it's the problem and the games being played and the politics being played is when you start to try to influence. Um, and maybe you can lead us right back to those three investigations and see how bad journalism and maybe politicking has attempted to influence the course of the country, but how uh, how Branka Brikic and Stefan's Brimmer from Amabungani has stood fast and ensured that that didn't happen. 
Absolutely. You know, I describe a critical meeting in the book, uh, in the Gupta Leaks, as the story came out, where um, they met this funder. And this funder said, OK, we need a journalistic strategy, we need a legal strategy, and we need a political strategy. And the journalists quite rightly said, no, 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 hold on. We're only concerned about a journalistic strategy. We don't do the politics. And yes, uh, we have to think about the law and how we manage in relation to the law. But our job is to do the story, to get it right, to get it complete and get it out. Um, and the minute she started to talk about a political strategy, that's when the relationship started to, to sour. And I think we're particularly sensitive in this country because I think we've seen a lot of political reporting in the last um, decade or perhaps a bit more that is politically motivated that's written by political writers who are there to serve not just a political cause, but perhaps a faction within the party. And I think that pollutes their journalism. And I think um, Gupta Leaks is a perfect example of, what, what, of, of how much better it is when you practice what I call slow journalism. You say, we'll take our time, we'll get the story right, and when it's complete and we verify it and we understand the story fully, we will publish. That's when we will publish. Um, as opposed to the Sunday Times stories, where they're under pressure every week to produce a front page story and a front page splash. And that pressure, driven by the fact that the paper was in financial squeeze and the managers are saying, we need to sell more copies, we need the big stories, and putting pressure on their investigative team, many of these stories, they rushed into print. Um, too quickly, what I call a journalism that's too fast. And one of the messages of my book is that, yes, as journalists, we like to be first with the story, but it's much more important to get it right. Take a breath, slow down, verify, get it right. Um, otherwise, you run into trouble. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Wonke Baba, one of our listeners um, and viewers, um, have a poignant question. Even trusted media houses can be misleading. How do I ensure, for an example, that Daily Maverick is telling a legit story, given the fact that the accused are always denying and presenting different stories? Now, you both um, sort of answered that already, but there might be um, another lesson to learn and to teach here is how do you evaluate um, the spin doctors of the world and how do you evaluate the person's right of reply who is being accused of nefarious ways mandy will you start and then anton you can right lead right into that look it's incredibly difficult um as journalists we all get it wrong sometimes and it's important to to acknowledge that i can i can tell you exactly when i've got it wrong because i remember um and and i'm sure we, we all feel the same way um but you know from a, from a journalistic side um you know, we, that's why we need to be thorough and be slow to so make sure that we evaluate the information, that we speak to as many people as, as possible and that we don't rush to print. And listen, that can be very, very difficult in a competitive environment where you are chasing the scoop and you want to be the first to break the story. And social media has just completely exacerbated that because there's so much more pressure on everyone to get a story out quicker. Um, the, you know, the diminishing... Um, newsrooms, uh, newspapers, it means that, you know, you have to have an edge all the time. So as journalists, you need to be more thorough and make sure that there's no agenda. And we see this with whistleblowers as well, that many of them have got some kind of, of, of motive. Um, everyone's got a motive. So, you, you know, you need to look at it and, and, and consider that too, is what does this person have to gain? And that's always, as a journalist, what you look at is what can this person, the source, be gaining from the story that we we are writing and I, I as a young journalist used to very naively think that I could be completely objective and fair and balanced and it's such a myth Anton's smiling at me because he knows that it's such a, a myth that you everyone's got a lived experience we've all got um you know these inherent biases that that influence the way that we perceive the world um and, and that's why you need to to consider it and 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 weigh it over look at it from every angle but for the the audience that is trying to discern whether something is is biased um you know you you have to firstly look at credible organizations that you know is doing a proper job and that comes with a track record and a history of of credibility but you also just need to be discerning yourself 
when you are reading something is that you, you need to be able to look at it and evaluate it and look for the gaps and look for the holes and say, well, you know, is there another take? There is never one side to a story. We know this. There's always a hundred sides to a story. Um, and, and that's what makes it so difficult. And that's why so many whistleblowers are, are perceived this way, because they they don't all just speak out of altruistic motives. They, they don't all have this like strong morality. Um, there's always some kind of, of, of agenda from, from everyone. Um, so I just think you need to be discerning more than anything else. Anton, would you offer us a view there? Well, I would agree entirely with, with, uh, with Mandy. I would say you have to be utterly skeptical. Never rely on one source. Read as many different versions of a story as you can and read them all critically. What are the gaps in the story? What doesn't make sense? Can I, is this a writer, an outlet that I can trust? Um, um, knowing that maybe they'll get it wrong, but if they get it wrong, they'll tell me and they'll correct quickly and clearly. Um, uh, but is it backed up by other trustworthy sources? I mean, the reality is you just have to be critical all the time and take nothing at face value. And it's incumbent on every single one of us as news consumers to, to look skeptically at everything written and say, can I believe this and can I not? You know, one of the dangers of social media is, is you can be in a bubble and only listen and talk to people who agree with you. So I think the compulsion to, to widen um, the versions you're hearing, uh, to read media that you don't agree with, um, in order to try and discern and, and start to put together what elements you believe or not believe and not just take it at face value, is absolutely critical. Um, I'm a great campaigner that we have to increase that media literacy that understanding of how to consume media critically, how to understand media, is something we're all going to have to take on board. Absolutely. Um, and one of the things that I've learned through my career, and when I read my, my colleagues' work or listen to their work, I look for detail. Um, the disinformation campaigns can make logical jumps and make strange um, decisions about how, what they emphasize. But proper investigative work always has a, a lot of detail um, and it shows you sometimes, if we speak about money, right to the cent of how much money flowed into someone's bank account So, um, or exactly how this information came to them. So a, a lack of detail often is a sign of, of trouble. Now, um, I'm mindful of time and I really want to, to go back to the whistleblowers as well. Um, and I'm, I have a cognition of Tabiso Zulu's tale um, in, in, of political violence in KwaZulu Natal. And it's, again, someone who has threatened um, with their lives. Will you, Mandy, please help us with, you know, is there a way um, we can get the police and the hawks maybe to, to shield whistleblowers? Um, or is the, the police and the hawks actually also not the people that you want to go to if you are a whistleblower? So, Pori, Tabiso Zulu's story is a, a, a great encapsulation of this, this problem. So, Tabiso Zulu, he's a um, corruption buster activist in KwaZulu Natal. Um, after Sindhisa Markaka was uh, shot, um, for this issue around the Umzumkulu Memorial Center. Um, Tabiso has been campaigning about corruption in KwaZulu-Natal, um, and he has always been a target, to the extent that he was actually shot in an attempted hit last year. Now, he went to court to force the police minister to protect him, because only if you are a witness um, in a case can you be protected by the police? So he was not a witness, but he wanted protection. So he had to go to force to, to police to, to court to force the police to protect him. He then went into witness protection and he lasted a week because it's just not sustainable. You have to give up your life, give up your identity, take on a completely uh, new identity. 
And that's not what he wanted. He wanted the police to protect him, but in his own environment. So the only reason they were able to do that was because he then became a complainant because um, he was a, um, a witness in another case. So this is an issue and it's a, a loophole where um, if somebody is exposing corruption, they can't be protected by the police. If you look at Ghana as an example, they have legislation which forces the police there to protect whistleblowers if they come forward and they expose something. So that is that is definitely a loophole in, in our law. And it is a, a concern because um, we've seen a rising number of political assassinations. Um, we've just seen the a rising number of hits in general in South Africa, um, which makes it so much riskier. I mean, there, there are a number of accounts in the book, um, as I mentioned, uh, about people who have blown the whistle on corruption and have been uh, killed as a result. Um, and it's very worrying because, you know, why would people want to come forward and talk out if if that's the, the implication for them? So that's that's something that I'm very concerned about, that we, we need to put a big red flag on and, and say, uh, you know, how can we better protect whistleblowers if they're going to come forward? Absolutely. Now, Jenny Ruiz says that she uh, now have even more more admiration and respect for whistleblowers and for their courage. But now I want to throw a fox into that chicken coop. Um, and this is a personal uh, perception. So I, I really would want to ask you to evaluate what I'm saying critically. I am very skeptical of people like um, uh, Angelo Agrizzi, who is trying now um, to be a whistleblower. And I think, Mandy, that was one of the strengths of your book. And I was so happy to read this morning that you critically told him that some people don't view you as a whistleblower because you benefited handsomely. And the fact of the matter is, with Angelo Agriti, but with many other whistleblowers now self-styled from Eskom, from the state, from certain um, corporations, private corporations, they handsomely received um, ill-gotten gains when it suited them and when it suited the politics of the moment. But when their institution or their company got into trouble, suddenly it wasn't popular anymore and, and they knew that the Hawks would be knocking soon. Now you, there's a pivot towards being a whistleblower and say, yes, I may have been influenced or manipulated, but maybe I didn't really know what I was doing and, and let me offer all this information and my hard drive and all the help. Um, I, I Personally, I don't think we can label them as whistleblowers. They're rather weather vanes. So please help us with, with um, evaluating these people. Do they still have valuable information? Um, and how do we regard them? So the, this is a very contentious issue, and I anticipated um, that it would be when uh, when the book came out. Um, and I do give Angelo Agriti and Suzanne Daniels and, and other people a, a very hard time in the book. Angelo specifically, and I said to him beforehand, I'm going to ask you difficult questions because many people don't believe that you are a whistleblower. So so look, Paulie, the way that, that I look at the definition of whistleblowers, according to the, the legal definition, is somebody within an organization who exposes wrongdoing. So it doesn't speak there about motive. The, the way that I view it, and I cast the net quite wide, admittedly, is I believe that there is a spectrum of whistleblower. I think on the one side, you've got many of the state capture uh, whistleblowers or, or other people that I've, I've written about in the book that are, are driven purely by altruistic motives, that, that are have got moral courage. It's black or white. And any transgression of the law should be exposed. And, and these are, are, are classic whistleblowers. And people think that all whistleblowers are like them, but they're not. Somewhere in the, in the middle, you've got what I like to call the accidental whistleblower. Somebody who realizes that they are witness to wrongdoing. They're not necessarily involved, but they realize that if they look the other way, they'll become complicit through their silence. And they decide to speak out because you know, for, what, for whatever reason. And in many of the instances, there are, there are many people who hold the information, yet only one of them decides to speak out. And I'm not sure what that is, why, why they decide to do that. And then on the far end of the spectrum, you've got the Angelo Agrizis, where people are complicit. They've got a proximity to wrongdoing. And you know that we need people like this. If you look at the VBS case, for example, you know that we need people that are involved in wrongdoing. This is how um, prosecutors the world over crack cases, but you can be a, a, a witness 
and not be a whistleblower. You can be a whistleblower and not be a witness. Um, you know, so I think that's important to establish. And in many of these examples, people are driven by self-preservation. They are doing it to save their own asses. And Angelo Greetsy said that to me. He he acknowledges, you know, it's driven by self-preservation. They remain whistleblowers in my book, although many people disagree with me and, and I, I hear them on that, but they are still telling us about what happened within that organization, which makes them technically a whistleblower. So Anton, if we take what Mandy says, do we evaluate this kind of information coming from a whistleblower like Angela Grizzi in a different way? Do we evaluate it with more circumspection or do we, we do we take it in and believe it because now he's got a reason to tell us what happened even though he was part of it? Oh yes, uh, you, you, you have to evaluate very carefully. What, what any whistleblower gives you, you, you have to either, you have to verify in some way, either from another source or obviously if they can give you documentation, uh, or you verify it in some other way. It's, it's essential for any source because as my book shows, there's many a source who will give you a story of which 90% can be true, but they use 10% of the story to go for their personal enemies or their, or people they want to go for. Um, so quite often uh, the story as a whole can be good, but it can be tainted uh, by, by the motivation of that particular person. The journalist's job is to verify, check what this horse is saying, understand their motives, look for documentary backup. I mean, the best thing is when a source can give you documentation because documents mean you don't rely on what they're saying or their version. They produce the evidence um, for you. So that's really the important role the journalists play of being between the source and the public in saying, we've looked at this, we could verify the following, we could not verify these bits. And, and these bits, in fact, we, we, we chucking out because we don't believe them. And, you know, increasingly important to journalism is transparency. And you spoke about this earlier, Paulie. By transparency, I mean that journalists have more than ever, I think, to tell you how they got their story, how they verified it, what they believe, what they don't believe, and why. Now, in the olden days, you would just present a completed story, say, this is what happened. Uh, but because of disinformation, because of social media, because the nature of our jobs has changed, um, we have to apply to ourselves a transparency that we demand of others who wield public power. Um, and I think it's a fundamental change in the way we have to practice journalism. Mm, very important. Mandy, last question. Um, one minute, because we're out of time. But Dario Milo, a media lawyer, has an important question that feeds right into how you close off your book about a culture relating to whistleblowers. And he asks, how do we as society do more for our whistleblowers apart from the enhanced legal protection and pro bono legal advice? So keep it quickly um, and, and then we, we finalize this. Webinar. So in South Africa, we have a long history of impimpies and uh, treating whistleblowers as being, um, you know, traitors. Uh, we're taught as kids that um, snitches get stitches. And we need to change that, that the, the way that society views whistleblowers. There has to be a cultural shift so that they don't wear the scarlet letter W, that we, we celebrate them, that we praise them, that we encourage them to come forward, that we hire them. And that's a challenge to corporate South Africa, to hire whistleblowers instead of looking at them as problematic or, or troublesome. And then I, I also, lastly, very quickly, do suggest that we set up something like a whistleblower house, a civil society organization that supports whistleblowers, that's possibly funded by government, um, that provides psychological, legal, financial, emotional, uh, physical support for, for whistleblowers. Mandy Wiener and Anton Harbour, thank you very much for your time. We learned a lot from you. I think we need uh, to uh, do a follow up because there's so much questions left. Thank you so much. Um, and then lastly, Maverick Insiders, thank you. You are appreciated. Thanks for everyone logging in today. Good day and bye.